Hi, good evening and welcome. Let's wait a minute for everyone to take a seat. I'm Luis Jaramillo, the Associate Chair of the School of Writing. We at the New School are happy to welcome back the National Book Critics Circle. For, for over a decade, we've been honored to host the finalist readings and the award ceremony here in Tishman Auditorium. This year, we've had the chance to work even more closely together. In conjunction with the NBCC, students of the New School Graduate Writing Program interviewed the 2012 award finalists. To give you an idea of the effort involved, New School students read 12,000 pages and put up a website in two weeks. On the website are 18 video interviews, seven audio interviews with authors from as far away as India and Greece, four text interviews, and three profiles. This job couldn't have been done without the leadership and vision of John Reed, an NBCC board member and beloved faculty member here at the New School. David Varno, Carrington Alvarez, Ben Jantz, and Bean Haskell deserve special recognition for their efforts, and we'd also like to thank the board for their help. I encourage you to check out the interviews at either bookcritics.org or newschool.edu slash writing, or uh, even if you just Google NBCC and New School interviews, it'll pop up. Um, I wonder if we could join in a round of applause for all those involved. For help with tonight's event, I'd like to thank Barbara Hofer of the NBCC, Lori Lynn Turner, Laura Kronk, Pamela Tillis, Brian Case, and Joe Carney. And now I'd like to turn the evening over to Eric Banks, former editor at Book Forum, senior editor at Art Forum, and the board president of the National Book Critics Circle. Please join me in welcoming Eric Banks. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Eric Banks. I'm president of the National Book Critics Circle. And it's my pleasure to, to welcome you all to the readings by the finalists of the National Book Critics Circle Awards for the publishing year 2012. We are honored to have uh, join us this evening on the stage 20 of our 30 finalists to read from their outstanding work in fiction, nonfiction, biography, poetry, autobiography, and criticism. Uh, I would also like to welcome George Hodgman, uh, the longtime editor of the late Anthony Shadid, whose life was tragically cut short last year. We are fortunate to have represented on the stage this evening the most exemplary works published in the past year. In many cases, our readers have traveled from far away to join us. One of them, uh, the writer Laurent Binet, coming, I think, the furthest all the way from France to read from the translation of his novel, HHHH. -H -H. Uh, I'd like to extend our gratitude to, to all the authors who have come to join us tonight, uh, no matter how far they came, uh, whether it's uh, from France or from just the other side of, of uh, Greenwich Village. Uh, we're flattered and excited to have you all here. The National Book Critics Circle Awards were founded in 1974 out of a conversation it took place at the storied Algonquin Hotel by a group of critics who wanted to establish a set of awards given by critics themselves. Unlike other national literary awards, the books that it would uh, be considered uh, would come directly from nominations offered by the critics, reviewers, and book review editors who made up the NBCC board. That nascent group of critics immediately set a very high standard, um, honoring Yale Doctorow's Ragtime, John Ashbery's Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror, R.W.B. Lewis's Edith Wharton, a biography, and Paul Fussell's The Great War in Modern Memory with its inaugural 1975 prizes. In the 37 years since those first awards, the NBCC has grown to include several hundred member critics and book review editors from across the country, and the number of judging categories has expanded from a dinky little four to a nice round six. The various activities, panels, and events that the NBCC sponsors have also grown uh, far beyond what the founders might have imagined in 1974. But we always strive to continue and to build upon their great example and to further their vision in recognizing the most robust and valuable titles published each year. As expressed in our simple but succinct mission statement, the goal of the NBCC is to honor outstanding writing and foster a national conversation about reading, criticism, and literature. The NBCC would not exist without the support of the literary community as a whole. The critics and editors who make up our 24-member board do so out of service to the organization. They have given freely of their time over the last 12 months and pouring over hundreds of titles, which is no exaggeration, uh, discussing them to, uh, with one another over the course of the year, and meeting in New York last January, this most recent January, uh, to arrive at the list of 30 books that we honor this evening. 
We also would not be able to put together our public free of charge events uh, without the generosity and support of so many other people and institutions. I'd like to thank in particular the New School University and especially Robert Polito, who is uh, sick this evening and unable to join us, Louise Harmillo, and Lori Turner for their hospitality in making the New School available to the NBCC for our deliberations, which will take place tomorrow, um, and our ceremony. A special thank you as well to the two publicists who have tirelessly devoted their time to the NBCC on a pro bono basis, Lauren Saran and Sarah Russo. And finally, I'd like to thank our uh, intern, Kate Ballou, and a very special thank you to our sole employee, uh, the jack of all trades, do it all David Varno, who is sitting uh, far overhead uh, above us in the tech booth managing our slideshow, which will begin very shortly. I guess it's already begun technically. <laughs> Uh, tonight's reading is the prelude to our ceremony tomorrow evening, when we will present the awards in each of our six categories, as well as the Nona Balakian Citation for Excellence in Reviewing, which will be presented this year to William Duresowitz, and the Ivan Sandroff Lifetime Achievement Award, which we will be, uh, recognize, uh, with which we will recognize the outstanding contributions tomorrow of Sandra Gilbert and Susan Goober. The award ceremony will be held at this same space tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock, and like this event, the award ceremony is free and open to the public, so we hope you'll rejoin us tomorrow night. <clears throat> we hope you will also uh, uh, take advantage tomorrow night of uh, our uh, immediately following the ceremony, uh, our benefit uh, reception, which will be held at the Lang Center at 55 West 13th Street. Tickets to the reception can be purchased at the door tomorrow night. Um, as I always like to, uh, to, to emphasize, the benefit reception is the only event for which the MBCC asks for a meager donation. Uh, if you'd like to further support the NBCC, though, you can do so by becoming a friend of the NBCC, which is a non-voting associate membership available to publishing professionals and readers alike. Uh, you can find details about it on our website. Uh, additionally, I, I'd like to note before we begin that uh, books by all of our 30 finalists are available for purchase outside the door. And before we begin, if you have your cell phone still turned on, please uh, take the time now to turn it off. Tonight's readers run the gamut from poets to biographers, novelists to critics. Their subjects, uh, subjects take us to North Korea and Mumbai to Texas Stadium, from the offices of ExxonMobil to the studio of Henry James. In their books, they've asked what is the blackness of blackness, what it means to discover Bach in the age of technical reproduction, and why there is something rather than nothing. And uh, if you want to find out the answer to that, you have to look at Jim Holt's book. Uh, to answer these and other centric questions, I'm happy to welcome tonight's readers. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Ferry. I'm going to read uh, two poems. First of them is called Resemblance. It was my father in that restaurant on Central Avenue in Orange, New Jersey, where I stopped for lunch and a drink after coming away from visiting, after many years had passed, the place to which I brought my father's ashes and the ashes of my mother and where my father's grandparents, parents, brothers had been buried, and others of the family, all together. The atmosphere was smoky, and there was a vague, struggling transaction going on between the bright daylight of the busy street outside and the somewhat dirty light of the unwashed ceiling globes of the restaurant I was in. He was having lunch. I couldn't see what he was having, but he seemed to be eating, maybe without noticing whatever it was he may have been eating. He seemed to be listening to a conversation with two or three others, shades of the dead, come back from where they went to when they went away. Or maybe those others weren't speaking at all. Maybe it was a dumb show. 
put on for my benefit? It was the eerie persistence of his not seeming to recognize that I was there, watching him from my table across the room. It was also the sense of his being included in the conversations around him, and yet not. Though this in life had been familiar to me, no great change from what had been there before, even in my sense that I, across the room, was excluded, which went along with my sense of him when he was alive, that often he didn't feel included in the scenes and talk around him, and his isolation itself excluded others. Where were we in that restaurant that day? Had I gone down into the world of the dead? Were those other people really shades of the dead? We expect that if they came back, they would come back to impart some knowledge of what it was they had learned. Or if this was indeed down there, then they, down there, would reveal to us who visit them in a purified language some truth that in our conditions of being alive, we are unable to know. Their tongues are ashes when they speak to us. Unable to know is a condition I've lived in all my life. A poverty of imagination about the life of another human being. This is, I think, the case with everyone. Is it because there is a silence that we are all of us forbidden to cross? Not only the silence that divides the dead from the living, but antecedent to that, is it that the silence there is between the living and the living? Unable to reach across that silence through the baffling light there always is between us? Among the living, the body can do so sometimes, but the mind, constricted, inhibited by its ancestral knowledge of final separation, holds back, unable to complete what it wanted to say. What is your name that I can call you by? Virgil said, when Eurydice died again, there was still so much to say that had not been said even before her first death, from which he had vainly attempted with his singing to rescue her. And the other poem is called Scrim. I sit here in a shelter behind the words of what I'm writing, looking out as if through a dim curtain of rain that keeps me in here. The words are like a scrim upon a page, obscuring what might be there beyond the scrim. <laughs> I can dimly see there's something or someone there, but I can't tell if it's God or one of his angels or the past or future or who it is I love, my mother or father lost or my lost sister or my wife lost when I was too late to get there. I only know that there's something or somebody there. Tell me your name. How was it that I knew you?
going to read three poems from Fragile Acts. More. We want more, but more is an emergent property. It comes for you out of the same constituents as when you were nothing but them yourself. From the unspoken, the far place nickels disappeared with their buffaloes. Most of us never believed the ordinary was that miraculous, the complex reducible completely to a few brash headlines. Look at the inquisitive Miles fingers that put on pianos, knocking softly though nothing opened. Perhaps the pretty demons inside failed to hear the twisting polonaise, hiding as they were behind the curtains in brocade covered with hunting scenes. Seeing the parade of notes festive, though death-dressed. One day, you discover from the ads, suspicious as the same look as discriminating, that greeny tigers have hidden their skins on the leaves of Diffenbachia. Ideas like onions are dropping their pale slips to the floor, that the garden is a smile around the house and around what is hidden by the house. Hitting the hot spots. Carol, who would not hurt the fruit flies, heat stunned on the red bedspread, under her gooseneck reading lamp, slipped paper we still call typewriter under two and moved them closer to the phone, hoping they'd recover. She imagined how things small as punkies or Dixie midges are picked up in storms or tornadoes and live a whole life moving from the first fingering updraft in Texarkana through the dust-fisted dynamo sidewinder ending on the other side of the trailer park in Mission, Kansas. That standing in the stereo half acre of Vivaldi cranked to nine is a kind of pressured equivalent to an afternoon alone in Denali's live silence, or Biscayne, a float above coral with a snorkel, a larva turning slowly as one of the Gulf Stream's glassy animals, Jeffersonian and Emersonian at once and closer to the sun. When she whirled and slapped a mosquito and mist, a red hand stayed on her leg throughout most of the chapter on self-reliance. Needless. Four birds carved in Thailand with skill that can miss a few feathers be painted differently each time and still be truthful. Imagination is creating the possible, its best work. Gaudy winged frogs, four-legged whistlebirds whose horns curve back to be handles are strange only until they find one in Suriname and feature its habits on discovery. That little stick sound we know is bare feet and slippers that little blur of mouse scratching its cheek with a hind paw, the wasp seeing pathways into the violent light, swatter arcing to the fly, feeling the railing with its mouth like a blind lover. The yellow dots, black, magenta, cyan, hovering together like a vertigo. But today, a Spanish dancer, Nudebrank, and angels appeared in the newspaper. Thousands in plastic bags taken wholesale from the rivers of the world. Stop. There is no need to spread the animals everywhere. No reason everyone should have a collection, including a few of everything. That is what the mind is for. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Alicia Stallings. Triolet on a line apocryphally ascribed to Martin Luther. Why should the devil get all the good tunes, the booze and the neon and Saturday night, the swaying in darkness, the lovers like spoons? Why should the devil get all the good tunes? Does he hum them to while away sad afternoons and the long lonesome Sundays or sing them for spite? Why should the devil get all the good tunes, the booze, and the neon, and Saturday night? Burned. 
You cannot unburn what is burned. Although you scrape the ruined toast, you can't go back. It's time you learned the butter cannot be unchurned. You can't unmail the morning post. You cannot unburn what is burned. The lovers in your youth you spurned, the bridges charred you needed most. You can't go back. It's time you learned smoke's reputation is well earned, not just an acrid, empty boast. You cannot unburn what is burned. You longed for home, but while you yearned, the black ships smoldered on the coast. You can't go back. It's time you learned that even if you had returned, you'd only be a kind of ghost. You can't go back. It's time you learned that what is burned is burned is burned. <coughs> Fairy tale logic. Fairy tales are full of impossible tasks. Gather the chin hairs from a man-eating goat or cross a sulfuric lake in a leaky boat. Select the prince from a row of identical masks. Tiptoe up to a dragon where it basks and snatch its bone. Count dust specks moat by moat or learn a phone directory by rote. Always it's impossible what someone asks. You have to fight magic with magic. You have to believe that you have something impossible up your sleeve. The language of snakes, perhaps, an invisible cloak, an army of ants at your beck, or a lethal joke. The will to do whatever must be done. Marry a monster. Hand over your firstborn son. And last, olives. <clears throat> Sometimes a craving comes for salt, not sweet, for fruits that you can eat only if pickled in a vat of tears, a rich and dark and indehiscent meat clinging tightly to the pit, on spears of toothpicks maybe, drowned beneath a tide of vodka and vermouth, rocking at the bottom of a wide, shallow, long-stemmed glass and gentrified, or rustic, on a plate cracked like a tooth. A miscellany of the humble hues eponymously drab, brown greens and purple browns, the blacks and blues that chart the slow chromatics of a bruise, washed down with swigs of barrel wine that stab the palate with pine sharpness. They recall the harvest and its toil, the nets spread under silver trees that foil the blue glass of the heavens in the fall, daylight packed in treasuries of oil, Paradigmatic summers that decline like singular, <coughs> archaic nouns, the troops of hours in retreat. These fruits are mine, small bitter droops, full of the golden past and cured in brine. Robert Moog invented the synthesizer he gave his own name. The Moog was a console the size of a refrigerator with knobs, dials, meters, and patch cords, all connected by cables to a set of speakers and to a keyboard in traditional black and white. When pressed, each key, instead of activating a hammer, sent an electronic signal to the console which processed it, synthesized it, so as to produce a particular sound. The Moog was monophonic. It could make only one sound from one key at a time. Chords were impossible. So was harmony. So was counterpoint. To play Bach and the Moog, then, would be to transcend the nature of the instrument, to make it something other than it was. That is what Walter Carlos did. His versions of Bach were a personal project, recorded on an Ampex tape deck customized to work with the Moog. He sent the recordings to Paul Myers of Columbia Masterworks in 1968, around the same time that he began to live as a woman in anticipation of the sex change. Tell me what you think, Myers said to Peter Mumbis, who as the Masterworks director of marketing was developing a line of crossover LPs. Mumbis loved the recordings and thought they could sell well, as long as the LP was devoted exclusively to Bach. For a title, I suggested Turned On Bach, Mumbis recalled. Somebody looked over and said, 
Nah, too drug related. Because it was turned on, tuned out, drop out, turned off. So Bill King said, what about switched on Bach? And I said, perfect. Movies had the counterculture audience in mind. I said, look, what's going on? The synthesizer is a popular instrument in rock bands. This is an audience that doesn't know diddly squat about Bach. So we'll do Bach on the synthesizer and we'll get them by the balls. <laughs> Mumby's sales pitch was inside out. The synthesizer was not yet a popular instrument in rock bands. It was hardly in use at all in rock music. Swish on Bach, as it turned out, would be a switch on the typical crossover album. It would not use the popularity of the synthesizer to advance the cost of Bach. It would use the popularity of Bach to advance the cost of the synthesizer, a pioneering new technology. Masterworks launched Switched On Bach with a party in New York, also devoted to the LP of Terry Riley's In C. There was a nice big bowl with joints on top of the mixing console, and Riley was there in his white Jesus suit up on a pedestal, playing live on a Farfisa organ against the backup of tape delays, said Robert Moog, who demonstrated the Moog synthesizer. Myers sent Switched On Bach to his prize artist, Glenn Gould, who praised it unreservedly in a piece for the Canadian magazine Saturday Night. He began by explaining that he despised anthologies, thought the genre exhausted. It's a bit surprising, then, he declared, that the record of the year, no, let's go all the way, the decade, is an unembarrassed compote of Bach's greatest hits, an assemblage that not even the reader's digest could have topped. <laughs> and it was a bit surprising that the performer was not a crack recitalist, but a young American physicist and audio engineer named Walter Carlos, who has no recording contract, whose most esoteric musical endeavor heretofore was the supervision of soundtrack material for a Schaefer beer commercial on TV. <laughs> Walter Carlos was the type of musician cooled in a vision in the prospects of recording. More a technician than a performer, one whose sight was the recording studio, and whose chosen instrument was emphatically a piece of technology. Switch on Bach was itself in line with Gould's sonic ideals. Because the individual lines of notes were recorded one at a time, the space between them is absolute, the counterpoint distinct and emphatic. This makes the music inhuman or otherworldly, but it also achieves the structural exactitude Gould strived for. In the same way, the Moog keyboard's lack of touch response produced an uninflected vibrato stream, free stream of notes, much as Gould sought to do with his high strung, screw tightened pianos. And yet, Carlos, like Gould, managed to infuse the music with character even so. The warmth of the synthesizer tones, the pump bass notes in the air on the G string, the clear, lean high notes, like the sounds of dolphins singing, makes the music personal, not mechanical. Robert Moog complained that Masterworks underestimated Switched On Bach, but in the next six months, several hundred thousand copies were sold, and it was recognized as a crossover album extraordinaire. If proof were needed that a Bach revival had come about, and that Bach's music was strong enough to become wildly popular without being violated, the proof was there on half a million record players. Woody flip-down consoles, brass-buckled portables, rubberized radio station platter players, crushed felt turntables with diamond-tipped tone arms, all burbling early electronic Bach. The record was symbolic in a deeper sense. The method of its making was akin to the method of the Bach revival. In it, single lines were brought together and made into a complex whole through technology. In it, the inventive powers of Bach were the spur to musical and technical invention, which brought out qualities in the music that were there all along. In it, some music made in small rooms went out into the world and then was brought back home by technology, there to roost in those small rooms, living room, bedroom, dorm room, finished basement, that were the sites of the modern person's imaginative life. In it, the promise of technical transcendence lurking just below the surface in the age of recordings was brought to light and made a goal to be yearned for openly, the goal to which the person in the age of recordings aspires. Thank you. I'm Daniel Mendelssohn, and I'm going to be reading from the end of an essay about the movie Avatar and the of of James Cameron. <laughs> In the closing moments of the film Avatar, the camera lingers suspensefully on the motionless face of Avatar Jake. Suddenly, the large feline eyes pop open, 
and then the screen goes black. We leave the theater secure in the knowledge that the rite has been successful, that the Avatar Jake will live, and that there will be sequels. <laughs> but the implications of this awakening in a character that Cameron himself described as an unconscious rewriting of the Wizard of Oz's Dorothy, it was, he said, in some ways like Dorothy's journey. The implications are not only different from, but opposite to the implications of Dorothy's climactic awakening at the end of her film. When Dorothy wakes up, it's to the drab, black and white reality of the gritty Kansas existence with which she had been so dissatisfied at the beginning of her remarkable journey into fantasy, into vibrant color. What she famously learns from that exposure to radical otherness is, in fact, that there's no place like home. Which is to say, when she wakes up, equipped to be sure, as she was not before, with all that she has learned from her remarkable odyssey, not the least of which is a strong new awareness of her own human abilities. She wakes up to the realities and the responsibilities of the human world she had temporarily escaped from. The triumphant conclusion of Avatar, by contrast, takes the form of a permanent abandonment of the gray world of Homo sapiens, which, as Dorothy learns, may contain its own hidden marvels. For the technicolor over the rainbow fantasy world into which its hero has accidentally strayed. This represents something new in James Cameron's work, something you can't help thinking is significant. In the director's movies of the 1980s and 90s, in the Terminator films, or in Aliens, in the misbegotten Abyss, and even in its way in Titanic, just before the advent of cell phones and iPhones, of reality TV and virtual socializing, and indeed of mashups, of this new moment in which each of us can inhabit what you might call a private reality. In those films, the encounters with radical otherness or with extremes of violence and disaster always concluded, however awkwardly in some cases, with a moment of quiet, a return to the reassuring familiarity of life as most of us know it. By contrast, the message of the new movie, his most popular thus far, the highest grossing film in history, is, like the message of so much else in the mass culture right now, that reality is dispensable altogether, or at the very least, is whatever you care to make it, provided you have the right gadgets. In this fantasy of a lusciously colorful trip over the rainbow, you don't have to wake up. There's no place like home has become, there's no need for home. Whatever its futuristic setting and whatever its debt to the past, Avatar is very much a movie for our time. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Kevin Young. This is from the end of the book, uh, it's a little section called Dear Mama. The hip hop love song is a genre inaugurated by Spoonie G's Love Rap from 1979, popularized by LL Cool J's I Need Love, elevated by Benita Applebaum, perfected by Mary J. Blige, and wedded in all its contradictions by Give Me One More Chance by Biggie Smalls the most unlikely seducer in the history of radio play. <laughs> or play, period. But to put that song on at a party, say, at an after party, dancing in a commandeered hotel room, is to see how Biggie's directness, which is sometimes crass, but always clear, can be honest and playful and pleasing. And that ugly, like noise, is not just relative, but something to be redeemed. Heart throb never, black and ugly as ever. The ladies seem to like it. The hip hop love song is not a genre in love with prettiness, but one of seduction and suspicion, of confession and conflict, even one of testing and testiness. It is like hardcore rap, which has a surprising number of such songs, 
about the beginnings of feeling and about the desire to desire. Notorious B.I.G. And even the hip hop love song ain't necessarily for lovemaking. It is not music to make babies by as with Barry White, Biggie's spiritual big papa. But for before, for the dance floor, the hustle, the grind, bumping uglies. Longing in hip hop is always aspirational. Hip hop even aspires to want. Hip hop charts a preparation for a feeling, not necessarily the feeling itself. I could really use a wish right now. In this way, hip hop isn't always useful for, or used to, the idea of being in love or of losing love. My girl, soul music sang, I feel love, sang disco. Like its crazy cousin nicknamed New Jack Swing, hip hop insists, I need love. You, you got what I need, but you say he's just a friend. <laughs> that space between meeting and making, between a good time and the nostalgia for those times, between good times, the song, and delight, is the one hip, good hip hop occupies. Being down seems to be the large, larger point of the hip hop love song. Real love, as Mary J sings. What's next? The music asks, like the dancer imploring the cosmic DJ. Just because you make a request, hip hop says, don't mean you'll get to hear it, but you can hope. Reina Grande, and I'm going to be reading from the first section of my book, which takes place in Mexico. My father had told us about his dream house in the letters he sent to my mother from the United States. The house was made of brick with the shiny concrete floor and tall white windows to let in the sunlight. The walls were painted the color of mommy's blue eyeshadow, and it had three rooms. Papi's dream house had a television, a stereo, a refrigerator, and a stove. It was a house with electricity, gas, and running water, and maybe even an indoor bathroom, one with a shower that made you feel as if you were standing in the rain on a sticky, hot summer day. That was the house that my father dreamed of. Back then, I didn't know that Guerrero was a Mexican state with the most people immigrating due to the scarcity of jobs. I hadn't known that a year before he left, my father had already been leaving home to find construction work in Acapulco, Mexico City, even as far as Mazatlán, Sinaloa, until eventually making his way farther north. At first, he had lived in California's Central Valley and had slept in an abandoned car while working in the fields harvesting crops, just as he had done in his youth. Eventually, he left to try his luck in Los Angeles where he was fortunate enough to find himself a stable job as a maintenance worker at a retirement home. Four years after my father left for the United States and two years after my mother left, the construction of our house finally began. Back then, I interpreted this to mean one thing, Papi and Mommy would soon be back. Workers came early one morning to tear down the outhouse and the shack in which I was born. Both the shack and the outhouse were made of bamboo sticks, so it didn't take long to get rid of them. I stood there watching, sad that my little shack was been destroyed. My sister put her arm around me and said, just think about what it's going to be built right there on that spot. The workers returned the next day and the day after and the day after and began to lay the foundation and after that, the walls. As soon as school let out, my brother, sister, and I would run down the hill to help out as much as we could. My grandfather handed each of us a bucket, and we carried bucketfuls of gravel and mortar. My brother Carlos worked specially hard. He liked working side by side with our grandfather. He wanted our grandfather to be proud of him for being quick and steady, not like us girls who were too slow and clumsy with the bricks and the buckets of mortar. 
but my grandfather didn't pay much attention to Carlos. We scraped our fingers carrying bricks. At night, we couldn't sleep from being so sore, but every day we put all of our energy into building our house, and when our fingers hurt too much, or our knees wanted to buckle under the weight of the buckets of wet mortar we carried to the bricklayers, we would tell ourselves that the faster we worked, the faster we would have a family again. That thought gave us strength. But it wasn't long before the workers stopped coming. By the time February came to an end, the workers were nowhere in sight. My grandmother said our parents had no more money, so the house had to wait. We stood by the door every morning before going to school, hoping to see the truck that brought the construction workers bumping and jerking its way down the dirt road. Then we headed to school, where all we did was look out the window and sight the hours away, leaning our sorrow on our elbows. By the end of the week, my sister stopped looking down the dirt road. She pushed Carlos and me up the hill and told us that it didn't matter anyway. She said that no matter how many bricks and buckets of water we helped carry to the bricklayers, the house would never be done because it was just a foolish dream, just as silly as our dream of having a real family again. It will get finished, Carlos said. They will come back. He took a running up the hill, and by the time we got to our school, he was nowhere in sight. When we got back from school, I went inside my grandfather's room to look at my father's picture. How much longer, I asked him, how much longer will you be gone? As always, there was no answer. Thank you. and I'm going to read a, an extract from chapter four of my poets. And it seemed maybe appropriate to read this here at the university. It's partly about struggling and failing to write an undergraduate thesis. It's called My Elizabeth Bishop, My Gertrude Stein. My Elizabeth Bishop begins with Gertrude Stein. This is not usual. Bishop is unusual, but not in the way Stein is unusual. I was not used to Gertrude Stein and found I could not get used to Stein, though I tried. I was struggling to find a topic for my undergraduate thesis. This seemed the most important thing in the world. Whatever is the world to you is the most important thing to you. I would be making myself in this thing. I was always making myself or being made. This was unavoidable. I was planning to be made by Gertrude Stein, but she was not cooperating. She was operating on another plane, a fractured cubist grid I could not make out. I was falling off the edge of Gertrude Stein, and there was no ledge for me, no stone to stand on in Gertrude Stein at that time. Why did I want to be made by Stein? She is, of course, very fine. Everyone thinks so, except those who don't, and many don't. She is, of course, ridiculous, until she's not. And then she both is and is not ridiculous, and what is ridiculous looks like something else completely. None of this I knew then. That was a different when. Then I had read her novel, Three Lives, and maybe a poem or two, a Valentine to Sherwood Anderson, and a sweet, 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 sweet Susie Asado do. A usual understanding was not demanded. I thought I could make Stein mine. I thought I would make a Valentine, my own thesis on Gertrude Stein. And then I read Stein, or other Stein, and found I could not find through Stein a line much less a through line. <laughs> it was summer. Depression is much worse in summer. The sun gloats. <laughs> it is summer, and it is rainy, and depression's gone. Then summer had me abed, anxious to find what I could find in Stein to make mine or be made by. I could find nothing in Stein, and my mind would not be mine. It was not mine, 
but neither was it Stein's. <laughs> On my desk, a book, Elizabeth Bishop, The Complete Poems, 1927 to 1979. Elizabeth Bishop outlived Gertrude Stein. She wrote many fewer lines. This book is inscribed with loving lines by my friend and then tutor, Janice Knight. Janice was a knight who shone. A knight errant did not err in sending me to Elizabeth Bishop. Elizabeth is my mother's name, and this is likely not irrelevant. Bishop was no bishop, but may have known some. She seems Episcopalian. My mother was a king, Elizabeth King, and kings outrank bishops, as Shakespeare proves. Harold Bloom claims Shakespeare invented the human, and Gertrude Stein wrote everybody's autobiography. It is a wonderful book, and had I read it that sun-gloating summer, I might never have made my move to Bishop. A knight in shining armor led me to Bishop, and the bishop seemed to shine more clearly than the stony stein I could not find my way through to be made by. For women can be knights like Britomart, cross-dressed in Spencer's fairy queen, braving her test, be bold, be not too bold. Thus, I came to bishop. Thank you. I'm reading for the late Anthony Shadid. Slowly, the townspeople had cried to the man driving the bulldozer, flattening what remained of their town. Slowly, slowly, it seemed that I heard in their voices all the others of those I had known over the years who had lost their homes. Some suffering cannot be covered in words. This had become my daily fare as a reporter in the Middle East, documenting, documenting war, its survivors and fatalities, and the many who seemed a little of both. In the Lebanese town of Kana, where Israeli bombs caught their victims in the midst of a morning's work, we saw the dead standing, sitting, looking around. The village, its voices and stories, plates and bowls, letters and words, its history, had been obliterated in a few extended moments that splintered a quiet morning. In the path of a bulldozer clearing the wreckage of lives was what would remain. A bag of onions, a can of beans, a blood-stained blue mattress, a tea kettle, a photograph of a young boy posing uncomfortably, backing awkwardly into manhood. Slowly, slowly, the request repeated itself to me as searching for some telling detail for another story to appear in the Washington Post. I noticed the fragrance of cedars and pines. Their smells seemed fresh and bracing, promises of renewal, until I discovered that the actual trees had been destroyed moments before, hours before, sorry. I had arrived in Kana to see webs of wire dangling along the suggestion of a street. Some Lebanese believe that it was here, amid grape arbors, olive groves, and fig trees, that Jesus performed his miracle, turning water into wine. Yet on this summer day, olive trees with gnarled trunks, perhaps a century old, were split like toothpicks. A tattered Persian rug jutted out the back window of an old Chevy hurled from someplace by an explosion. A donkey braid, a terrified cat shot through the rubble while Israeli shelling thundered in the distance. Moments later, a rescuer rose from the ruins, back slightly stooped. Cradled in his arms was a one-year-old child, Abbas Hashim, the 20th century, excuse me, the 27th victim of the bombing of Kana. A blue pacifier dangled from his green top. A bruise covered his forehead, and his tongue hung listlessly from his mouth. Behind him lay a book, the keys to heaven, the corners of its pages charred. Most of the dead had choked on flying dirt and other debris. 
their bodies intact, preserve their final gestures. A raised arm called for help, an old man pulled on pants. 12-year-old Hashim Hussein lay curled in the fetal position, his mouth seeming to have vomited earth. Mohammed Shalub sat on the ground, his right hand broken. Khadija, his wife, and Hasna, his mother, were dead, as were his daughters, Hara and Zara, age 12 and 2, as were his sons, Ali 10, Yaya 9, and Asim 7. I wish God could have left me with just one child, said the former father. Sugar enslaves out of a little cove to the north of the island. 
of Monte Cristo. But his father, Antoine, neither rich nor hardworking, was the eldest son. In 1775, Antoine sailed to France to claim a family inheritance, pawning his black son into slavery to buy its own passage. Only after he secured his title and inheritance did he send for the boy, who arrived in French soil in the fall of 1776, listed in the ship's record as the slave Alexander. The 16-year-old moved in with his father, now a marquis, to Paris, where he was educated in classical philosophy, equestrianism, and swordsmanship. But then he set off on his own and joined the army at the lowest rank. He specialized in fighting wounds. When the French Revolution erupted three years later, the cause of liberty, equality, and fraternity gave this young man his chance. He got his first officer's commission at the head of a band of fellow revolutionary black swordsmen called the Black Legion. And in the meantime, he met his true love, an innkeeper's daughter, while riding in to rescue her town from brigands. If all this sounds a bit like the plot of a 19th century novel, that's because the life of Thomas Alexandre Davy de la Paetrie, who took the simple surname of his black slave mother when he enlisted, becoming Alexandre, or Alex Dumas, was the inspiration for some of the most popular novels ever written. His son, the Alexandre Dumas we all know, would find the inspiration for The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo in the dizzying rise and tragic downfall of his own father. At over six feet tall, with an athletic physique, Alex Dumas cut a dashing figure among the French elite. But how was it that he could enter the elite, indeed be celebrated as a national hero, at a time when the basis of French wealth was black slavery in the colonies? The life of General Dumas is so extraordinary on so many levels that it's easy to forget the most extraordinary fact about it, that it was led by a black man in a world of whites at the end of the 18th century. The explanation for how such a life had even been possible lie in another forgotten story, that of the world's first civil rights movement. Slaves taken to France brought lawsuits against their masters and won their freedom over the king's direct objection Compare this with the infamous Dred Scott ruling in the United States Supreme Court, which, a century later, we find that blacks are, quote, so far inferior that they have no rights the white man is bound to respect. With the revolution in 1789, the dream of equality in France suddenly seemed almost limitless. By the time he was 31, Alex Dumas was promoted to general, having earned the admiration of every officer and soldier who fought beside him. A fellow officer, who openly proclaimed a horror of Negroes, not to mention of Jews, nevertheless wrote that General Dumas might be called the finest soldier in the world. Alex Dumas eventually rose to be the equivalent of a four-star general, the highest rank held by a man of color in any Western army until General Colin Powell, nearly two centuries later. His ascendancy as a black man through the white ranks of the French army reflected a key turning point in the history of slavery and race relations, as forgotten as Dumas himself. A single decade when the French Revolution ended slavery and integrated its army, its government, even its schools. Alex Dumas was the standard bearer for this new society, a living emblem of the new equality, wrote a 19th century French historian. Dumas, the son of a marquis and a slave, had the unique perspective of being from the highest and lowest ranks of society at once. <coughs> the true idealist, he did not cease to espouse his views once they'd fallen from favor. His imprisonment in an enemy fortress, where he languished for two years until he was released into an even more agonizing labyrinth of betrayal in his own country by his own side, foretold what would become of the ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity especially for France's men and women of color. When Dumas was trapped in the dungeon, Napoleon made himself dictator and dismantled France's post-racial experiment. He imposed cruel race laws in France, reinstituted slavery in the colonies, and sent an invasion force to Saint-Domingue with orders to kill or capture any black who had worn the officer's uniform. Dumas' son, the future novelist, novelist would take a marvelous sort of revenge. Influ infusing his father's life and spirit into fictional characters who have been embraced the world over. 
Yet while every generation has heaped glory on the name of Alexander Dumas, the great general has remained forgotten. The only statue of him, in a country awash in marble generals, was erected in Paris more than 100 years after his death and then destroyed by the Nazis in 1942. Thank you. Services of 
approximately two dozen pilots and several dozen additional support staff, also thanks to his wife, Charlene, who often traveled with the chairman and who favored bowls of wrapped chocolate. Aviation services staff talked amongst themselves about which ExxonMobil executives with jet privileges were the most arrogant or prone to temper over petty problems. The capacity of some of Exxon's multimillionaire leaders to become abusively angry over delays caused by bad weather, pilot changes, or mechanical problems never ceased to amaze their more modestly salaried crews. Lee Reagan could be sharp tongued, but he was not by any means the worst offender. He was respected. He was also feared. Some managers who had worked in other corporations, even notably hierarchical and disciplined ones, found striking the atmosphere of terror and deference Raymond generated in the minds of many who worked for him. Although it was possible to locate people who would say that Raymond was not insulting or mean to them personally, even these exceptional people acknowledged that he was often unpleasant to large numbers of other people. <laughs> Some of those who knew Raymond well and liked him overall felt he badgered colleagues in part to keep people away from him. If this was a strategy, it worked. He won the nickname Iron Ass among some of his employees. <laughs> Behind his desk in the God Pod hung a painting of a fierce tiger. Raymond saw himself as an oil and gas, oil and gas purist. He told colleagues outside uh, that outside ExxonMobil's headquarters, the corporation should carve in stone the words crude oil. He felt that it was critical that the employees, quote, not get confused about what we are trying to do around here. Uh, this is from an interlude called An Hegelian in Paris. Pure being makes the beginning. I read these words while sitting yet again at a table in the Cafe de Flore. This time I am on the terrace of the cafe, facing the busy Boulevard Saint-Germain, and across the street, the Brasserie Leap, with its promise of choucroute garni. It was one of those rare early spring days when the delicate oyster shell gray of the Parisian sky gives way to an axis of brilliant sunshine and cobalt blue. Distracted by the lovely weather, I look out from the page for a moment, hoping that I might spot an acquaintance or at least a recognizable face among the parade of people passing to and fro along the broad sidewalk in front of me. Pas de bête. So I sit the last bit of the Cafe Express I ordered, my fourth since I've been here, and return to my book, which happens to be Hegel's Science of Logic. That may seem an odd, not to say pretentious, choice of reading material for an idle afternoon at a fashionable and overpriced left-bank cafe. But it is an odd, really. I am, after all, in a place that Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir made their daily headquarters some decades ago. It was here in the winter of 1941-42, during the German occupation of Paris, that Sartre began composing his most ponderous philosophical treatise, Being and Nothingness. That winter was a brutally cold one, but the proprietor of the cafe, a Monsieur Gouval, was adept at procuring enough black market coal to keep the interior at least minimally heated, enough tobacco to supply the wants of its smoking patrons. Sartre and de Beauvoir would typically show up first thing in the morning and install themselves at the warmest table next to the stove pipe. Sartre would ask for a cup of tea with milk, his sole order for the entire day. Then, still bundled up in his fake fur coat of bright orange, and wearing his round, worn-rimmed glasses, he would scribble away for hours at a stretch, barely looking up from his paper, except, as Beauvoir had recalled in her memoirs, to retrieve from the floor and stuff into his prior pipe the occasional cigarette butt discarded by another customer. And how did Sartre begin his epic inquiry into the relationship between being and nothingness? With a description of this very cafe as, quote, the fullness of being, followed by a lengthy riff on the dialectic of being that Hegel set out in his logic. So it is hardly incongruous that I should be striking in the alien pose here. As for pretentious, well, Cathy de Flore sets a very high bar for pretension. <laughs> my, my purpose, though, is a serious one. What I'm struggling to do is see the world in the most abstract way possible. That, it seems to me, is the best remaining hope for puzzling out why the world exists at all. Every one of the thinkers I'd already spoken to fell short of complete ontological generality. They saw the world under some limited aspect. To Richard Swinburne, it was a manifestation of divine will. To Alex Valenkin, it was a runaway fluctuation of quantum vacuum. To Roger Penrose, it was the expression of a platonic mathematical essence. To John Leslie, it was an outcropping of timeless platonic value. Each of these ways, uh, to John Updike, it was a bit of cosmic light verse. 
Each of these ways of seeing the world reported to yield the answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing? But none of these answers struck me as satisfactory. They didn't penetrate to the root of the existential mystery to what Aristotle and his metaphysics call being qua being. What does it mean to be? Thanks.
I had witnessed and learned the terrifying joy of unbearable responsibility, recognized how it conquers everything else. Sometimes, I had thought the heroic parents in this book were fools, enslaving themselves to a life journey with their alien children, trying to breed identity out of misery. I was startled to learn that my research had built me a plank and that I was ready to join them on their ship.
special time with Bravo is just one of the multitude of pleasures available to them. And thinking about it makes Billy somewhat bitter. It's not that he's jealous so much as profoundly terrified. Dread of returning to Iraq equals the direst poverty. And that's how he feels right now, poor, like a shabby homeless kid suddenly thrust into the company of millionaires. Mortal fear is the ghetto of the human soul. To be free of it is something like the psychic equivalent of inheriting a hundred million dollars. This is what he truly envies of these people, the luxury of terror as a talking point. And at this moment, he feels so sorry for himself that he can break right down and cry. I'm a good soldier, he tells himself. Aren't I a good soldier? So what does it mean when a good soldier feels this bad? Don't be scared, Shroom said, because you're going to be scared. So when you start to get scared, don't get scared. Billy has thought about this a lot, not just the Zen teaser of it, but what exactly does it mean to be scared out of your mind? Shroom again. Fear is the mother of all emotion. Before love, hate, spite, grief, rage, and all the rest, there was fear, and fear gave birth to them all. And as every combat soldier knows, there are as many incarnations and species of fear as the Eskimo language has words for snow. Spend any amount of time in the realms of deadly force, and you will witness certain of its fraught and terrible forms. Billy has seen men shrieking with the burden of it. Others can't stop cursing. Still others lose their powers of speech altogether. Loss of, loss of stinker or bladder control, classic. Giggling, weeping, trembling, numbing out, classic. One day he saw an officer roll under his humvee during a rocket attack, then flatly refused to come out when it was over. For Captain Tripp, a pretty good man in the clutch, but when they're really getting whacked, his brow flaps up and down like a loose tarp in a high wind. His soldiers might feel embarrassed for him, but no one actually thinks the worst of him for it. For this is pure motor reflex, the body rebels. Certain combat stress reactions are coded into genes just as surely as cowlicks or flat feet. While for a golden few, fear seems not to register at all. Sergeant Don, for example, an awesome soldier who Billy has seen walking around calmly eating skittles while mortars rain down mere meters away. Or a man will be fearless one day and freak the next. As spooky and, excuse me, as fickle and spooky as that, as pointless, as dumb. He gets so tired of living with the daily beatdown of it. Not just the normal animal fear of pain and death, but the uniquely human fear of fear itself. Like a TV stuck on skip repeat. An ever narrowing self-referential loop that may well be a form of, form of madness. Thus all our other emotions evolved as coping mechanisms for the purpose of possibly keeping us sane. And so you start to sense the humanity even in feelings of hate. Sometimes your body feels dead with weariness of it. Other times it's like a migraine you think you can reason with. You bend your mind to the pain, analyze it, break it down into ions and atoms, go deeper and deeper into the theory of it until the pain dissolves in a flatus of logic. And yet after all that, your head still hurts. Thank you.
husband never had a second thought in his life, she told him. When he extended the cigarette to her, she looked at the way he held it in his fingers, and she turned again to face the lights. You smoke like a gang man now, she told him. I like the way you used to smoke when you were still a boy from nowhere. I'll always be a boy from nowhere, he told her. He reached for her, and he took her arm. You can't touch me, she said. You know the rules. She tried to pull loose, but he didn't let her. Rules, he asked. To come tomorrow, there won't be any more rules. Well, tomorrow's not here yet, she said. It's on its way, he told her. Sixteen hours. That's how long it takes a jet to get here from Texas. Tomorrow's in the air right now, circling the world to us. She took the cigarette. I know what you're after, she said. I know what you want with your talk of tomorrow. What if something goes wrong, he said. What if today is all there is? Today, tomorrow, she said. A day is nothing. A day is just a match you strike after the 10,000 matches before it have gone out. He let go of her. She turned to the rail. As the landscape blacked, it became easier to see the set of headlights of a vehicle climbing the mountain switchbacks toward them. You want me, she said. You don't even know me. I know your hand reaches for mine when you sleep, he said. I know that. Her Hanbach, a gray graphite, glowed dully black. I know you're no gang band, he said. I know you were born on a cot. He could make out the sound of the car below, but he couldn't guess it's coming. Enough, she said. You've tasted a flower before it had you, he asked. I said, stop it. He reached for the small of her back, pulling till their bodies touched. Their faces were close, her looking up into his eyes. You don't know the first thing about her, she said. Only one person knows who I really am, and it's not you. I'm sorry about your husband, he said. What I did to him, what I did, I had no choice. Please, she said. I'm not talking about him. He didn't know himself. Who then? A black Mercedes pulled up. The driver exited and opened the door for her. A real problem has arrived, she said. The man who knows me, he wants them back. The man they dog recognized the car. So this is how it would be. The dear leader had tugged the string that would finally unravel him. What was it Sun Moon had told him? That when the dear leader wanted you to lose more, Gave you more of those.
how they tended to have few intimates in emotional terms. They left the social bonding to the wives, so they were bound to them. And she was ready to tell him all the details if that was what he wanted. She was prepared to come clean. But a toiler could so easily be hurt. A toiler was chronically exhausted from his long days of labor. What labor, you might ask? The labor of being a man, of course. <laughs> it was hard to be a man. The men were all insane, basically, <laughs> due to testosterone. <laughs> you could see it in them, roiling under the surface. The few exceptions proved the rule, and the smart one were smart, smart men were big enough to admit it. For instance, steroids made you more of a man, chemically, and also, not a coincidence, made you insane. <laughs> She'd read that autism was thought by scientists to be an exaggerated form of maleness. <laughs> so there was that. <laughs> the latent madness and retardation of men was compounded by the fact that most of them didn't get to kill their own prey anymore, <laughs> stop living things, and slay them in a savage bloodletting. <laughs> the men, even when they didn't know it, were frustrated by this. They were unfit to live in civilized society. Of course, women were also subject to hormonal madness, famously so. The estrogen or whatever, so-called premenstrual syndrome, the chemicals that in excess made them into caricatures of women. Hysteria, for instance, as Freud had called it, neurosis, that time of the month. Of course, Freud had been largely discredited. He had been a philosopher more than a scientist, and Americans did not trust philosophers. Far from it. Also, he did cooking. <laughs> Why would you talk about yourself that way? Why would you talk about your area that way? Oh, you just pissed me 
your boy, I'm from Arlton, a certified union worker, 20 years. And I'm ashamed of you right now. You're the reason why we're where we are right now. Shame on you, shame. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ooh. Girl love. Oh, you think this is funny? Said the rascal. Keep laughing, my sister. Where do you think this leads? Said the rascal to the girl. Me? But I ain't even involved. How am I even involved? Nowhere, said Natalie. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere. Mummy, stop shouting. Natalie didn't know why she was shouting. She began to fear she was making herself ridiculous. I feel sorry for you, really, said the previously uninvolved Indian man, who now joined the circle of judgment. <laughs> You're obviously very unhappy, dissatisfied young people. <laughs> oh, my days, don't you fucking start, cried the girl. How did this even get like, to this level? She asked, laughing. I'm just sitting here chilling. How am I even involved? Marcus, man, this is on you. Next thing I know, I'm on fucking Jerry Springer. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Asked the old white woman, who now stood with the rest by the roundabout. I don't think this is very funny. Oh, man, this is long, said the girl. This one's back at it now. Old Mother Hubbard's on the fucking case again. This shit is crazy. All of this, asked Marcus, for a cigarette. Is it really worth it, though? Just sit back down where you was and calm yourselves. Go handle your business. Sit down, man. Fools, said the girl. Just put it out, man, said Natalie. But she had not ended a sentence in man for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs>